Section 11, Electrical. When work being performed as described within this chapter conflicts with the above codes and regulations, the most stringent shall apply. Some of the terminology used describing electrical voltages, high voltage is considered over 15,000 volts, medium voltage is 601 to 15,000 volts, low voltage is 600 volts and less. Most voltages on job sites are less than 600 volts. Higher voltage are usually worked by qualified linemen. Special training is required for work on electrical equipment. All electrical work shall comply with the applicable National Electrical Safety Codes, NESC, the National Electrical Codes, NEC, OSHA, and U.S. Coast Guard regulations. Electrical work shall be performed by qualified persons with verifiable credentials who are familiar with applicable code requirements. The verifiable credentials consist of state, national, and or local certifications or licenses that a master or journeyman electrician may hold, depending on the work being performed and should be identified in the appropriate AHA. A qualified person electrical is one who has received training in and has demonstrated skills and knowledge in the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installations and the hazards involved. This includes the skills and techniques necessary to distinguish exposed live parts from other parts of electrical equipment, to determine the nominal voltage of exposed live parts, the clearance distances and corresponding voltages to which the qualified person will be exposed. Employees exposed to shock hazards and those employees responsible for taking action in case of emergency shall be trained in methods of release of victims from contact with exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. Employees shall be regularly instructed in methods of first aid and emergency procedures, such as approved methods of resuscitation if their duties warrant such training. Training of employees in approved methods of resuscitation include cardiopulmonary resuscitation and automatic external defibrillator AED use shall be certified by the employer annually. Electrical burns are the most common shock-related non-fatal injuries when you touch electrical wiring or equipment that is improperly used or maintained. It typically occurs on the hands and is a very serious injury that requires immediate attention. Before work begins, a qualified person in charge shall ascertain by inquiry, direct observation, and by instruments whether any part of an electrical power circuit, exposed or concealed, is located such that the performance of work could bring any person, tool, or machine into physical or electrical contact with it. This verification procedure shall be documented prior to work beginning. A sketch shall be developed to show the location, voltages, means of protection of all circuits, including receptacles, disconnecting means, grounding, GFCIs, and lighting circuits. All equipment and circuits to be worked on shall be de-energized before work is started. Personnel shall be protected by hazardous energy control program and procedures, i.e. lockout and tagout, blanking, positive means of blocking, grounding, etc. Positive means shall be provided for rendering controls or devices inoperative while repairs or adjustments are being made to the machines they control. Energized work may never be performed without prior authorization. Once it has been determined that equipment must be worked on in an energized condition, an energized work permit shall be submitted to the GDA for acceptance. Employees working on electrical circuits shall remove all conductive articles, for example, jewelry and clothing, watch bands, bracelets, rings, keychains, necklaces, metal, cloth with conductive thread, or metal headgear. Potential outcomes of contractor mishaps include such things as shocks and electrocutions, arc blast and burns, falls, explosions, fires, and all of these can lead to property damage, injury, or death. Some of the direct causes of electrical mishaps are things such as drilling and cutting through cables, defective tools, cables, and equipment, failure to maintain clearance distances, failure to follow standard lockout, tagout, groundout procedures, and failure to guard live parts. Additional direct causes of electrical mishaps, failure to use the proper electrical PPE, unqualified personnel, improper installation slash use of temporary electrical systems and equipment or bypassing electrical protective devices. Indirect causes of electrical mishaps include such things as lack of training, 
No standard operating procedure for the operation. Lack of supervision. Failure to apply activity hazard analysis by the site superintendent. Inadequate site-specific safety training prior to the phase of work. Approved safety plan not implemented. Proper tools, materials, and PPE not provided. Regular site safety inspections not performed. And lack of management leadership. All portable flexible cords or cables, for example extension cords, shall be inspected by the user of the cord at least daily for maintenance and construction activities and before each use. Inspections should check for loose parts, missing pins, damage to insulation and outer jacket, whether they are properly protected from damage, and whether they are protected by bushings or fittings if passing through holes. All portable flexible cords or cables, for example extension cords, shall be inspected by the user of the cord at least daily for maintenance and construction activities. Portable flexible cords shall contain the number of adequately sized conductors required for the load plus an adequately sized equipment ground conductor. A qualified person shall determine appropriate hard or extra hard usage flexible cord length and size as specified in the National Electrical Code, Article 400. Portable flexible cords shall be a minimum 14 wire gauge. The size and number of the wires is indicated on the cord. Insulation type printed on the cord. In this example, S means hard or extra hard usage. Note, a complete listing of all markings can be found in the National Electrical Code. Portable flexible cords shall be used only in continuous lengths without splice or tap. The repair of hard service cords and cord sets is permitted if the conductors are spliced in accordance with the National Electrical Code. The splices must be performed by a qualified person with the insulation is equal to the cable being spliced and the wire connections are soldered. This example shows improper use of an electrical cord where they have a male plug on each end jumping between two different circuits. Some other cord violations, an improperly installed uh, electrical outlet at the end of the cord showing exposed wires and the cord is not uh, constrained by the strain relief device. The other picture shows an electrical cord being run through a door which creates a pinch point and could damage the cord. These pictures illustrate damage to the outer insulation of an electrical cord. Currents as small as 10 milliamps can paralyze or freeze muscles. For example, an electric power drill uses 30 times as much current as what will kill. Arc flash safety. What is an arc flash? An arc flash is a short circuit through the air when insulation or isolation between conductors is breached or no longer can withstand the applied voltage. Workers on or near energized conductors or circuits, movement near or contact with the equipment or failure of the equipment may cause a fault resulting in an arc flash. Suitable barriers or other means shall be provided to designate an arc flash boundary area that ensures workspace for exposed energized electrical equipment and should not be used as a passageway. Arc flash labeling must be placed on energized equipment. Labels are required to warn of potential electrical arc flash hazards and appropriate PPE. Labels, at a minimum, shall include limits of approach, nominal system voltage, hazard or risk category, required PPE, and incident energy at the working distance. All personnel entering the identified arc flash protection boundary must be qualified persons and properly trained in accordance with NFPA 70E requirements and procedures. Training must be administered by an electrically qualified source and documented. Access and working space shall be provided and maintained around all electrical equipment to permit safe and ready operation and maintenance in accordance with NFPA 70 equipment space requirements. Where clearance is not feasible, for example, floating plants and vessels, procedures shall be in place to ensure sufficient clearance for fully opening the door and or servicing the electrical enclosure and shall be maintained. Electrical arcs can result in temperatures over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, explosions, hot gases, melting metal, radiation burns, severe eye damage, and death. Electrical work over 50 volts on energized parts requires arc flash hazard analysis in accordance with NFPA 70E to determine safe boundary from the hazard, special training, and special PPE for the workers. Note, arc flash coveralls are based on the anticipated hazard rated in calories of heat. For example, this picture indicates the label on an arc flash suit that is rated at 11 calories per square centimeter. Personal protective equipment shall include hard hat rated class E high voltage work, 
special high voltage gloves, eye protection, and foot protection. Disconnects for motors and appliances shall be legibly marked to identify service, feeder and branch circuits, and disconnecting means or overcurrent device to be legibly marked to indicate its purpose. An unintentional electrical path between a source of current and a grounded surface is referred to as a ground fault. Ground faults occur when current is leaking somewhere. In effect, electricity is escaping to the ground. How it leaks is very important. If your body provides a path to ground for this leakage, you could be injured, burned, severely shocked, or electrocuted. This slide indicates various examples of GFCI receptacles. For indoor use and for outdoor use, the outdoor use contains a cover that uh, fully encloses the outlet when cords are plugged in. For temporary electrical power, all receptacle outlets, 120 volt, 15, 20, or 30 amperage and greater, that provide temporary electrical power during construction, remodeling, maintenance, repair, or demolition shall have grounds fault circuit interrupters, GFCI protection for personnel. Lighting circuits shall be separated from receptacle circuits. Panel circuits shall be labeled lights only and tool circuits shall be labeled tools only. This picture illustrates an improperly installed temporary lighting circuit where they are using wire to hold the fixture in place. This is an example of a typical temporary lighting violation which shows a broken light bulb in the socket. Safe work practices for temporary wiring. The vertical clearance for temporary wiring, 600 volts or less, shall be 10 feet above the finish grade for sidewalks or from any platform, 12 feet over vehicular traffic other than truck traffic, 15 feet over areas for truck traffic, and 18 feet over public streets, alleys, roads, and driveways. A receptacle in a wet location shall be contained in a weatherproof enclosure, the integrity of which is not affected when an attachment plug is inserted. All temporary lighting strings in outdoor or wet locations, such as tunnels, culverts, valve pits, floating plants, etc., shall consist of lamp sockets and connection plugs permanently molded to the hard service cord insulation. Switches, circuit breakers, fuse panels, and motor controllers located outdoors or in wet locations shall be in a listed weatherproof enclosure or cabinet. These pictures illustrate an outlet for use in wet locations. It shows a power cord in use and has a cover that closes fully over the cord to ensure watertight connections.